certain time comes, just to get up, to go and sit with your teacher, and to talk to him and listen to him, and then go home again. All these procedures are our practice. In this way, without any idea of attainment, you are always Buddha. This is true practice of Zazen. Then you may understand the true meaning of Buddha's first statement, see Buddha nature in various beings, and in every one of us. Quote. Epilogue. Zen mind, before the rain stops we can hear a bird. Even under the heavy snow we see snowdrops and some new growth. Quote. Here in America we cannot define Zen Buddhists the same way we do in Japan. American students are not priests and yet not completely laymen. I understand it this way. That you are not priests is an easy matter. But that you are not exactly laymen is more difficult. I think you are special people and want some special practice that is not exactly priest's practice, and not exactly layman's practice. You are on your way to discovering some appropriate way of life. I think that is our Zen community, our group. But we must also know what our undivided original way is and what Dojin's practice is. Dojen Zenji said that some may attain enlightenment and some may not. This is a point I am very much interested in. Although we all have the same fundamental practice which we carry out in the same way, some may attain enlightenment and some may not. It means that even if we have no experience of enlightenment, if we sit in the proper way with the right attitude and understanding of practice, then that is Zen. The main point is to practice seriously, and the important attitude is to understand and have confidence in big mind. We say, big mind, or small mind, or Buddha mind, or Zen mind, and these words mean something, you know, but something we cannot and should not try to understand in terms of experience. We talk about enlightenment experience, but it is not some experience we will have in terms of good or bad, time or space, past or future. It is experience or consciousness beyond those distinctions or feelings. So we should not ask, what is enlightenment experience? That kind of question means you do not know what Zen experience is. Enlightenment cannot be asked for in your ordinary way of thinking. When you are not involved in this way of thinking, you have some chance of understanding what Zen experience is. The big mind in which we must have confidence is not something which you can experience objectively. It is something which is always with you, always on your side. Your eyes are on your side, for you cannot see your eyes, and your eyes cannot see themselves. Eyes only see things outside objective things. If you reflect on yourself, that self is not your true self anymore. You cannot project yourself as some objective thing to think about. The mind which is always on your side is not just your mind, it is universal mind, always the same, not different from another's mind. It is Zen mind. It is big, big mind. This mind is whatever you see. Your true mind is always with whatever you see. Although you do not know your own mind, it is there. At the very moment you see something, it is there. This is very interesting. Your mind is always with the things you observe. So you see, this mind is at the same time everything. True mind is watching mind. You cannot say, this is myself, my small mind, or my limited mind, and that is big mind. That is limiting yourself, restricting your true mind, objectifying your mind. Bodhidharma said, in order to see a fish you must watch the water. Actually when you see water you see the true fish. Before you see Buddha nature you watch your mind. When you see the water there is true nature. True nature is watching water. When you say, my zazen is very poor. Here you have true nature, but foolishly you do not realize it. You ignore it on purpose. 
there is immense importance in the I with which you watch your mind. That I is not the big I. It is the I which is incessantly active, always swimming, always flying through the vast air with wings. By wings I mean thought and activity. The vast sky is home, my home. There is no bird or air. When the fish swims, water and fish are the fish. There is nothing but fish. Do you understand? You cannot find Buddha nature by vivisection. Reality cannot be caught by thinking or feeling mind. Moment after moment to watch your breathing, to watch your posture, is true nature. There is no secret beyond this point. We Buddhists do not have any idea of material only, or mind only, or the products of our mind, or mind as an attribute of being. What we are always talking about is that mind and body, mind and material are always one. But if you listen carelessly it sounds as if we are talking about some attribute of being, or about, material, or, spiritual. That will be a version of it, maybe. But actually we are pointing out mind which is always on this side, which is true mind. Enlightenment experience is to figure out, to understand, to realize this mind which is always with us and which we cannot see. Do you understand? If you try to attain enlightenment as if you see a bright star in the sky, it will be beautiful and you may think, ah, this is enlightenment, but that is not enlightenment. That understanding is literally heresy. Even though you do not know it, in that understanding you have the idea of material only. Dozens of your enlightenment experiences are like that. Some material only, some object of your mind, as if through good practice you found that bright star. That is the idea of self and object. It is not the way to seek for enlightenment. The Zen school is based on our actual nature, on our true mind as expressed and realized in practice. Zen does not depend on a particular teaching nor does it substitute teaching for practice. We practice Zazen to express our true nature, not to attain enlightenment. Bodhidharma's Buddhism is to be practice, to be enlightenment. At first this may be a kind of belief, but later it is something the student feels or already has. Physical practice and rules are not so easy to understand, maybe especially for Americans. You have an idea of freedom which concentrates on physical freedom, on freedom of activity. This idea causes you some mental suffering and loss of freedom. You think you want to limit your thinking, you think some of your thinking is unnecessary or painful or entangling but you do not think you want to limit your physical activity. For this reason Hayakujo established the rules and way of Zen life in China. He was interested in expressing and transmitting the freedom of true mind. Zen mind is transmitted in our Zen way of life, based on Hayakujo's rules. I think we naturally need some way of life as a group and as Zen students in America. And as Hayakujo established our way of monastic life in China, I think we must establish an American way of Zen life. I am not saying this jokingly, I am pretty serious. But I do not want to be too serious. If we become too serious we will lose our way. If we are playing games we will lose our way. Little by little with patience and endurance, we must find the way for ourselves, find out how to live with ourselves and with each other. In this way we will find out our precepts. If we practice hard, concentrate on zazen, and organize our life so that we can sit well, we will find out what we are doing. But you have to be careful in the rules and way you establish. If it is too strict you will fail, if it is too loose, the rules will not work. Our way should be strict enough to have authority, an authority everyone should obey. The rules should be possible to observe. This is how Zen tradition was built up, decided little by little, created by us in our practice.
We cannot force anything. But once the rules have been decided, we should obey them completely until they are changed. It is not a matter of good or bad, convenient or inconvenient. You just do it without question. That way your mind is free. The important thing is to obey your rules without discrimination. This way you will know the pure Zen mind. To have our own way of life means to encourage people to have a more spiritual and adequate way of life as human beings. And I think one day you will have your own practice in America. The only way to study pure mind is through practice. Our inmost nature wants some medium, some way to express and realize itself. We answer this inmost request through our rules, and patriarch after patriarch shows us his true mind. In this way we will have an accurate, deep understanding of practice. We must have more experience of our practice. At least we must have some enlightenment experience. You must put confidence in the big mind which is always with you. You should be able to appreciate things as an expression of big mind. This is more than faith. This is ultimate truth which you cannot reject. Whether it is difficult or easy to practice, difficult or easy to understand, you can only practice it. Priest or layman is not the point. To find yourself as someone who is doing something is the point. To resume your actual being through practice, to resume the you which is always with everything, with Buddha, which is fully supported by everything. Right now, you may say it is impossible. But it is possible. Even in one moment you can do it. It is possible this moment. It is this moment. That you can do it in this moment means you can always do it. So if you have this confidence, this is your enlightenment experience. If you have this strong confidence in your big mind, you are already a Buddhist in the true sense, even though you do not attain enlightenment. That is why Dogen Zenji said, Do not expect that all who practice Zazen will attain enlightenment about this mind which is always with us. He meant if you think that big mind is somewhere outside yourself, outside of your practice, then that is a mistake. Big mind is always with us. That is why I repeat the same thing over and over when I think you do not understand. Zen is not just for the man who can fold his legs, or who has great spiritual ability. Everyone has Buddha nature. We each must find some way to realize our true nature. The purpose of practice is to have direct experience of the Buddha nature which everyone has. Whatever you do should be the direct experience of Buddha nature. Buddha nature means to be aware of Buddha nature. Your effort should extend to saving all sentient beings. If my words are not good enough, I'll hit you. Then you will understand what I mean. And if you do not understand me just now, someday you will. Some day someone will understand. I will wait for the island I was told is moving slowly up the coast from Los Angeles to Seattle. I feel Americans, especially young Americans, have a great opportunity to find out the true way of life for human beings. You are quite free from material things and you begin Zen practice with a very pure mind, a beginner's mind. You can understand Buddha's teaching exactly as he meant it. But we must not be attached to America, or Buddhism, or even to our practice. We must have beginner's mind, free from possessing anything, a mind that knows everything is in flowing change. Nothing exists but momentarily in its present form and color. One thing flows into another and cannot be grasped. Before the rain stops we hear a bird. Even under the heavy snow we see snowdrops and some new growth. In the east I saw rhubarb already. In Japan in the spring we eat cucumbers. Afterward. Zen mind. Beginner's mind at 50. When Shunryu Suzuki first saw a published copy of Zen mind. Beginner's mind. 
He looked it over for a minute and commented, good book. I didn't write it, but it looks like a good book. Quote, that was 50 years ago, the summer of 1970. He and a few students were in the foyer of the San Francisco Zen Center's city center, standing around some boxes of the newly published hardcover. Almost 50 years before that, in the early 20s, as a young Zen monk strolling through the shops and stands in the bustling trade city of Yokohama, Suzuki had lamented the poor quality of Japanese furniture, toys, and other items bound for export. He wondered why they didn't send abroad the best of their crafts and arts. Maybe someday, he thought, if he studied and applied himself sincerely, he could bring to the West what to him was truly the best his homeland had to offer. The way of his Zen mentors. He never completely let go of that idea, and eventually the knots of duty loosened, an opportunity arose, and he flew to San Francisco carrying a painting and a hidden plant. Most of Suzuki's students didn't get too excited when Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind came out. We had him and he told us to forget what he said in lectures and put our effort wholeheartedly into Zazen and mindfulness. People did study, but his talks weren't thought of as being more important than the sutras, Chinese koan collections, and other Buddhist writings. The most enthusiastic responses came from outside of the community of his students. Today there are other collections of his lectures, several books about him and his teaching, more books and articles with something on him or from him, and much more on the internet, including all his extant lectures. There are more than 70 groups in his lineage spread around America and Europe. But Shunru Suzuki's renown as a seminal spiritual teacher is almost entirely due to this one unique volume. In 2004 Weatherhill, which originally published Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, became an imprint of Shamhala Publications. Now in 2020 with this special edition, Shamhala commemorates the 50th anniversary of the publishing of these celebrated, informal talks on Zen meditation and practice. Quote, More significant than Zen mind, beginner's mind's sustained sales is its universal appeal. It easily moved past the perimeter of Buddhism into libraries, university classes, and reading groups. It now shows up on almost any list of modern spiritual classics in the West. Writer Amy Tan and MacArthur Genius Grant recipient cartoonist Linda Barry have both shared in interviews that they begin their workday with passages from Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Philanthropist Lawrence Rockefeller said he kept it by his bed. Film director Sam Peckinpah opened it one evening and didn't put it down all night. Basketball coach Phil Jackson refers to it repeatedly in his book Sacred Hoops. Poet Michael McClure sent Hell's Angel, freewheeling, Frank Reynolds a copy of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, to help him clear his head, when he was in Soledad prison. Reynolds said the book saved his life. German composer Walter Zimmermann created a long song for piano entitled, Beginner's Mind, with words from the German translation. In 2000, Tosca, the Viennese, Masters of Deluxe Soundscapes, released Suzuki, an album dedicated to Shunru Suzuki. I've seen quotes from it on greeting cards, on the side of a soy milk container. It was the favorite spiritual book of Steve Jobs, who in the mid-70s practiced Zazen at the Los Altos Zen Center where the lectures were given. Former Apple intern Mark Benioff, billionaire CEO of Salesforce and owner of Time magazine, has frequently quoted from this book and reports he lives with beginner's mind. In How the Swans Came to the Lake, Rick Fields' sterling history of Western Buddhism, he wrote, Zen mind, beginner's mind had a fresh, early morning quality to it. Suzuki Roshi spoke with a spare voice, unpretentious and humorous. It was, 
In fact, an American Buddhist voice, unlike any heard before, and yet utterly familiar. When Suzuki Roshi spoke, it was as if American Buddhists could hear themselves perhaps for the first time. The Buddhist scholar and Dogen translator Kazuaki Tanahashi commented. Suzuki Roshi digested Dogen's teaching fully and presented it in his own words. So if we study Dogen and read Zen mind, beginner's mind carefully we find an invisible but strong connection. Quote. Many readers have a genuine and lasting affection for this book. For a couple of years, a poet named Janine Lentine with support from the San Francisco Zen Center worked on the page project, in which she collected scans of people's personalized pages of Zen mind, beginner's mind, with notes written in the margins, words underlined, doodles, corners folded, held close passed along. She writes, left behind, read aloud, consulted in the middle of the night, carried on the subway or bus, Zen mind, beginner's mind seems to engage the reader in a direct and warm conversation. Quote. In 2009. For the 50th anniversary of Suzuki's arrival in America. Janine created an exhibition in which each page of the book was represented by someone's contribution. Culled from hundreds sent her, including pages translated into Czech, Dutch, Finnish, French, German, Icelandic, Japanese, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We're not sure how many languages it's been translated into. Janine says there was a student at the city center who read it in his native Mongolian translated from the Russian version. Janine has dedicated this page to my friend Lee Brichetti, a poet and executive director of Poets House in New York. On the morning of September 11, 2001, she was on her balcony, 31 floors up, looking out over Lower Manhattan and reading this book and as she read the line, because we cannot accept the truth of transiency, we suffer, she heard the first plane roar overhead. Quote. From a letter sent to the page project. Amidst this torment, I looked up. On my shrine sat a copy of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, with the back cover quietly lighting the cabin. Suzuki Roshi's kind and mildly humored gaze moved me to tears. I took the book from the shrine and opened it at random. I don't recall which chapter I read. Likely it wouldn't have mattered. Suzuki Roshi's words melted my struggle. Quote. Indeed, Robert Bonney's photo on the back cover is a key ingredient. It gazes out from many a wall and refrigerator. The Tibetan Rinpoche Chogyam Trungpa, who called Suzuki his accidental American father, placed that photo on his group's altars along with that of his own teacher. Mrs. Suzuki, however, didn't approve of that photo, at least when she first saw it, and wondered aloud why a formal photo of her husband in ceremonial robes hadn't been used instead of one taken when he was in his work clothes and needed a shave. The society photographer Yvonne Lewis used to come with her Zen student comedian son Mark to hear Suzuki lecture in San Francisco. She commented, each person's face has two different sides. Suzuki Roshi had a face in which each half was so totally different from the other that I was fascinated by it. The side with the eyebrow up on the Zen mind, Beginner's mind photo is the mischievous side and the other is his contemplative side. Richard Baker, Suzuki's American Dharma heir, observes that the right side of his face is the calm, normal, conventional person and the left side with the eyebrow up is the enlightened side communicating, showing itself, wondering, skeptical, who are you? The Estonian poet Jan Kaplinski refers to this photograph in a poem called, Shunru Suzuki, translated into English with Sam Hamill. Shunru Suzuki